Exact asta. Anca, nu să te rog unde ești. Anca ne-a ajutat să aducem astăzi aici un expert în branding de sunet și am să te rog, Anca, să ne-l prezinți. Nu o să vă găsesc de audio branding, nu vă stăiați. Uh, I will switch to English because I want Uli to hear what I say and to understand what I say about him. Uh, first of all, he's my colleague at school. Uh, we did the school together, Berlin School of Creative Leadership. And when I first met him, we did the module in the US. And I've heard he's a musician. And actually after that, I found out that actually he's a composer. And he specified to me the difference between a composer and a musician today. And he said that the composer composes the music and the musician is playing the music. And I said, ah, that's the difference. I didn't know about it. We are calling him Big Uli at school because he's really big. You can see how big he is. And he's a composer. And he did a, a similar presentation to Cannes, um, Cannes Festival this year. And uh, I was really impressed because um, I found out a lot about what is the role of audio branding in the life of our brands and why it's important when we create brands to take care of this sensorial effect of a brand. And um, he's a German and he has also a Nashville, Tennessee accent because he lived there for long. So I give you my colleague Uli. Thank you so much, uh, Akanuta, and um, yeah, uh, and it's I think a salute and uh, merci for having me here. And uh, um, uh, two things you should know about me is uh, that my biggest passion, hands down, is music, and uh, I went to uh, Los Angeles when I was 20 um, to study film scoring and conducting and, um, and worked on uh, Star Trek and the Next Generation, which was um, just an amazing experience. And went on to work on uh, cartoon music for Disney and uh, on a show called Goof Troop. And went back to Germany uh, taught at university a little bit and, um, and then kind of hit a midlife crisis and started writing songs and moved to Nashville, Tennessee. And um, I discovered I, I really suck at songwriting because these guys are really good and, and uh, but it, it was absolutely fascinating. And in the end, I went there because I met my business partner, Steve Keller, um, who couldn't be here. Uh, he's actually speaking in Hong Kong uh, today. And he talked to me about looking at music from a completely different point of view, which was strategy, research, measurement, evaluation, design. I said, what are you talking about? What, what, what is this? And he said, well, it's called really audio branding. So, what you, I think the biggest misconception, I think I'm going to start there, is that most people in advertising branding think of audio branding as an audio logo. That is partly true. Um, but think about Michael Jackson. If he would sing 50 songs, you would know within the first two, three seconds, that's Michael Jackson. His voice is audio branding. The song he, sing, he sings is the music you would maybe use in a TV commercial or a point of sale soundscape or whatever. But it's very important to understand right from the get-go, it's not the audio logo. The audio logo is a part of the audio DNA, the genetic code of the brand. And this is where we usually run into big problems because it is finding the voice. Think about a, a good friend that you call for 20 years 
And the main thing is you trust that friend. And part of that is he always has the same frequency. Each of you is a completely unique voice. We have almost about 8 billion people on this planet. Everyone a completely unique voice. It's the same with the brand. What we want as brands is first, we want to be in the trust building business and in the remembering business. Then we've done a good job. And uh, imagine that friend talking to you with a different voice every time you talk to him. He makes sense in everything he says, but sometimes he, you know, talks up in a squeaky voice and then dark and then slow, fast, different dynamics. At a certain point you would just say, dude, get it straight. Find your voice with which you speak to me. Then I trust you. And I think that is what I really want to start out with. Um, Let's look at audio logos, and I will play you three, and you don't have to close your eyes. And what we'll do, we'll understand it's a pair association, and we will detect something through that pair association with our ears only. The sensory medium we first used when we listened to our mother's heart it was the first thing we couldn't see. We listened. And big data, everything, you know, what it teaches us is buying decisions at the end of the day are subconscious. They don't they don't they're not being made with, you know, Consciously, yes, I want this. At the end of the day, it's like your subconscious trust. Yeah, I want exactly that. So, let's try. Does this work? Anybody? Anybody? Thank you, Intel. Um, there was no claim, no visual or verbal branding present. And you made a pair association with your ears only, which were 360 degrees. You don't have to see anything. You can close your eyes. Here I make another connection. 90% of all major consumer brands disappear with your consumer's eyes closed. They cannot be identified. Anybody? Telecom T-Mobile, T-Mobile in the US. And uh, what's interesting about this logo is that actually graphically it goes ba, 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 ba. It mirrors the visual logo. Let's have a look at this one. Anybody? Coca-Cola, yeah. Um, what was interesting about this, this is called uh, a Shared equity position. What well, means the, the artist is Kanan. It was the World Cup 2006, and Coke saw that his, his song, Wave the Flag, climbed the charts. And so they talked to him. This song didn't exist like this in the beginning, it was just Wave the Flag. But then Coke because they were disciplined in the past and they have an audio identification which goes ba 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 talk to him and say I want to offer you a shared equity position here's the deal you're already this far up in the charts could you get our logo into your song and start it with that and we'll give you X amount of money how's that and using all our communication 
And uh, that's what they did. Let's say we go out for dinner tonight, and I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to show you anything, I just want you to listen to something. Where are we going to go? Mexican? Okay. Italian, interesting. Any French, interesting. Okay. Anybody? Indian? You probably all, almost have a toy, the taste, you could recall right away. Multi sensory. And again, I did all this without showing you anything. There's a fork. What does that mean? Always think back. You know, when you work with brands, when you work in, in identification, it's like, can I be identified by sound only? Let's talk about product sound. Um, you work with a guy, his name is Professor Dr. Charles Spence. This sounds very complicated. He's head of the Cross Model Research Lab at Oxford University. And what he does, he tests products for Procter Gamble and Unilever mainly. So what they want to know is before they put a spray or deodorant on the market, well, what's the most sexy sound of this or the most Let's say it's a male product. Um, so what they do is uh, they cheat. They go in the studio, they get 60 people, and they give them different spray cans. And each time they spray, they say, well, how sexy is that? How male? How female? How yellow? How whatever? You go through the questions. What the test persons don't know is they heard the same sound. They, 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 all the, the, the engineer did was he adjusted frequencies. So they had different spray cans and they thought they sound different, but all he did, he was adjusted for its frequency. But pretty much there was a consent at some point, oh, this is the most sexy sound. This is the most bright sound. And so, comes out this, yes. This. Yeah. And this is. This is no accident. This is a muffler designed according to the specs from evaluation and testing. This was not, oh, this looks great, let's do it like that. This is exactly designed, no accident, on, you know, okay, probably every one of you knows this product. Well, try. <laughs> uh, let's move on. Uh, Here's a company out of Southern California, Sunchips, environmentally very conscious, and they want to create a biodegradable bag. And here's a company that did not pay attention to product sound at all. So what they did is by accident, because all they were thinking of was, it needs to be biodegradable. And we're going to communicate that, and that's going to be great because we're so environmentally conscious. What they didn't realize, they created the loudest bag ever. Let's have a look. <laughs> so, 
this went all over, the, uh, over social media and um, they made jokes. They went with, with decibel meters into the supermarket and, and, and went into movie theaters and just did this on purpose and people just freaked out and said, dude, this is like three times as loud as the normal geo chips back or something. And they had to go back and redesign the fabric out of which they designed this back because they didn't take it, they didn't pay, pay attention to audio. BMW, this car has an excess of 500 horsepower and they severely test. And the people that drove this car, they said, I don't get it. It doesn't feel right. I, 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 I don't know. I don't want to pay this much money for this kind of car. And the problem is cars get less noisier, less noisier, less noisier. They go towards silent which is actually against the law. Because again, we don't, if I want to get your attention, I don't do it visually. The ambulance out there, they don't say, the, the, the cops, they're so loud here, it's unbelievable. I'm like in my hotel room, and I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God. And it's like, we want to, you know, feel it on a visceral level, on a deep, deep down, and it is to our ears, which we cannot close. A baby doesn't get your attention by waving. It screams and your spine freezes. <laughs> That's attention. And nature made it that way. We, we cannot close our ears. We can close our eyes. You know. Ears, not so much, but we live in a visual dictated world. And we're missing the boat completely. So what they did was, um, it tested so bad. They said, no, 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 we, we cannot do this. They repiped. No, they actually, they didn't. Porsche did. They actually emulated the sound of the engine, and you could dial it in on the dashboard with your radio system, how much engine noise you wanted. Um, Porsche goes one step further on the new 911, um, where you can, you know, select whatever engine sound you want, and then how much you want. And they actually are very authentic because they repipe it back into your passenger room, which is really interesting. It's not artificial; it's repiped. Let's talk about return on investment very, very important for companies you work with. Companies don't like being told, oh, um, here's your audio logo and it's going to be great. Here's your DNA, here's your audio genetic code, it's going to be really great. They say, uh, and, and why exactly is that? And they ask a lot, a lot of questions. And we work with clients, they ask a lot of questions. And they want to know, because they, this, this is a process that usually a C-level or owner of the company, CEO or founder. Because it's a, it's a question, if you answer it and you make a mistake, you're screwed. It, and, and, you know, on a commercial, if it doesn't work that well, hey, three weeks, three months, okay, it's off air. On your identity of giving you your voice, if you're wrong, if you're incongruent. Professor Charles Spence from Oxford University actually put it, puts it in numbers. You decrease the effectiveness of visual communication by 1,108% through incongruent audio. Meaning, if I speak like this, it doesn't make sense with what you're looking at. So, Dunkin' Donuts, return on investment case. How am I on time? Am I just a, a, just, I'm a little lost. How much? 12 minutes? Oopsie. Um, let's, 
Let's talk, yeah, it's good. Let's talk about return on investment. Um, Dunkin' Donuts out of South Korea. What they did is they installed atomizers, uh, these, are, these little puff things, in buses. And they had a campaign with the new audio logo. Every time a logo would play, the atomizer would inject the smell of freshly brewed coffee into the bus. So there was again a, a paired association with, oh, I hear that and I, I smell the coffee. So when you would leave the bus station, they had huge posters of coffee cups. And uh, these were the numbers. They had in their stores a 16% increase in traffic, 29 in sales. Old Navy out of the US. Super Bowl. Um, they Shazammed the song. Anybody familiar with Shazam? It's a, it's an app you can hold against the speaker. And uh, they Shazam the song during the Super Bowl. They had a 70% redemption rate, people going in, and a 30% increase in engagement. All good, fair trade bananas out of New Zealand. These are all can lions, gold cases, and Grand Prix cases, by the way. Listen to your conscience. It was a supermarket, and this little plaque, all, all good, fair trade bananas, and could step in and would say, Psst, psst, it's your conscience speaking. I know you're trying to make a good decision. You're trying to buy good, fair trade bananas. And you would, you would say, well, people would look, you know, they would step back in. And um, it was just a lot of engagement. And, and it's important at point of sale that the other brand is not heard by your brand. So that's why directional speakers from, you know, that, that is limited. It's not everything is just, if I step here, listen, if here, it's done, it's, it's off. It's very important. Legal reasons. Um, here are the numbers. 130% increase in sales. This is no joke. Starhub in Malaysia, um, they redesigned our DI devices for shoplifting. You know those, those white things that beep if you steal something? Uh, and what they did was according if you would buy hip hop clothes or you know late night gown or, or jeans or whatever, they had a different playlist. And they would, through technology called proximity messaging, they would actually play you that playlist once you're changing inside the changing room, because it would be triggered, and then through proximity messaging, give you a coupon on your phone and say, hey, do you want to download 10 songs? Click through rate, 21% increase in sales. Let's look at that. Just to give you an idea on a social Media message for teenagers to be safe around trains, how to get 91 million clicks. This is more than Rihanna. Young people don't listen to public safety messages, so how do you get them to stop being unsafe around trains? By making it the dumbest way to die. Dumb way to die. The song was written called Dumb Ways to Die. It was released as a YouTube video and within a week had over 20 million views and coverage on every television network in the country. A dedicated Tumblr site generated huge and immediate viral effect. Within days, Dumb Ways to Die became the world's most shared video, beating out another music video released on the same day, Rihanna's Diamonds. The song was released on iTunes and charted in 28 countries and in some countries even making the top 10. 
Radio advertising was purchased, but this song about rail safety was so popular, radio stations played it for free. Not as an ad, but as part of their music programming. We published a little book of dumb ways to die and distributed it in schools. We made a hugely popular smartphone game featuring all our characters. Outdoor advertising was created specifically to generate Instagram friendly branded content. And at train stations, a karaoke version of the song played while posters visually reinforced the message. The results? People adopted the rail safety message like never before. Over 200 cover versions were made. Schools started using it as a teaching tool in classrooms. By taking a branded content rather than an advertising approach, Dumb Ways to Die became the most shared public service campaign in history. And most important of all, the Metro has seen a 21% reduction in accidents and deaths compared to the same time last year. Be safe around trains, a message from Metro. Think about a return on investment and the money you put in and the money you got out of this. Um, I'm not going to make it through my presentation because if you say, you know, I should go ahead, okay. I just have a, a quick look. I'm going to run through these a little bit. Uh, just ask yourself, you know, Audio branding establishes sonic personality, identity, moves decisions to objective. It's not an art and it's not a science, it's both. Return investment. Don't think about creation. Strategy informs creation. In ad agency land, we always go towards creation right away. It's medieval. It's like throwing paint against the wall and see what sticks. You can identify 97% of colors that you don't want to use because they're incongruent with the brand's emotional attributes. They will never make sense. So you don't have to call five music production companies and say, oh, we'll do 10 logos each and then we'll have 50 and then we'll do inside the executive circle with a brand, we'll pick the logo because we know better. Don't do that. The house is going to come down. There's no foundation. What's an audio agency? We work a lot with ad agencies together, they were really scared in the beginning because they said, what are you doing? You're usually a third party vendor we call to brief and say, you do the music. What are you doing at you know, uh, strategy meetings with a CEO or the CMO? What, what are you doing there? We, we don't understand, we, we cannot box it. And what we believe in is in collaboration, most of all. That we go in as equal partners because we want to know, you know, from the agency how how do they tick? And we have the process about four meetings. And what we always do is we run the entire presentation with the agency, and then once they say it's okay. And they totally, we totally respect the agency-client relationship that is, that is holy to us. And once they say that that is good, or they say, hey, leave that out because that's a tricky subject. We could never know that. And then we go to the RAM together, and then we present. So, not you can say, we do asset creation. Procurement management. Think of audio as an asset that you want to find in your PL. If you buy the company Intel today, you have a line item that says audio logo worth this much. 
and it's worth several times more than the visual logo. Why? The recall is so much higher, and you can measure that today. Strategy, analysis, and design. We do research, testing, and we evaluate. It's not shooting from the hip and say, oh, it's great. You need an evaluation process. Let's talk through a process, and I'll do this in 10 minutes if you want to. It's very similar to verbal and visual branding. You define the brand essence, you conduct three different audits. One is historical. Um, I don't know if British Board is a brand that anybody knows. It's a chocolate brand we just finished. But they just celebrated their 100th year birthday in Russia, Germany, Italy, US. We went through 100 years of what they did with audio. Think of audio, think, think of this as a, as a bank. If you open a bank account and you have visual, verbal, and sonic identification, every time you show a logo or show a claim, you pay money to a bank account that you can eventually withdraw money from. Because there's a recall with the consumer the consumer identifies. Ankanuta with Unicredit, I see the logo, sure. I don't even have to read Unicredit. It's an immediate peer association. But the problem with this brand, it's mute. It's completely mute. It's unidentifiable through your ears. If you close our eyes, the brand vanishes on a global level because the brand didn't pay into an account from which they withdrew. They only used money as a mood or, you know, mood altering. That doesn't work. You do competitive analysis. What are the others doing? Um, and very important, uh, a contextual analysis. In which context are we using audio with a brand? We create an emotional profile of the brand, an audio map. This is done through a scientific process on an axis, I'm so sorry, an axis of valence and arousal. And what you can do is you can pinpoint where the map is where the brand is, and you can pinpoint where the competitors are. And from this information, you can actually go and have information about how fast should the music be. Where is it in pitch? Where is it in dynamic? What are the emotional attributes? And again, I could go into this, but this is from Schuler Fair and Science uh, guys that wrote big, big books about this. Let's move on. First workshop is an audio mood workshop. Most brands have already done massive amounts of work in finding their genetic code. So we pretty much use the first meeting we have with the brand is like we, we pretty much get everything together and we'll go home and in about two months we'll come back and say, is this you? Because this is how we see you. And, and they say, yeah, that's interesting. And we have usually observations about the brand and try to make it very clear who they are because at the end of the day, we're trying to find the voice for the mute brand. Uh, we do an audio mood workshop, meaning we it's an exclusion process, it's not an additive process. We try to end up with the 3% and exclude the 97%. Again, think about color throwing against the wall. We try to get to a point very quickly where we know 
97% of all these colors we don't even have to throw. They'll never work. We don't try to take the magic out of music, but the way it's done now is catastrophic because it ends up being I don't trust you brand because you sound different every week. You have no clue who you are, you have an identity crisis, you're behaving like a teenager who's desperately trying to find us, you know, who am I in this world? Big, big global brands act like teenagers. And that needs to stop. They're super disciplined in verbal and visual communication. It's written in stone. Audio, meaningless, accidental. So we created an audio brand brief after all the information. Here, some elements of audio branding. At this stage, quick example, we're establishing audio databases for global brands. So let's say um, a chocolate company. And let's say the bite of the chocolate on the breaking of the knick pack, which is very important, we found out for exactly this brand. All of a sudden we found out in Russia they use a celery stick, in the US they use a carrot, in Italy they use whatever instead. This is, and you want to be an authentic brand? No way. We went in the studio with 27 different brands of chocolate not brands of chocolate, but, but I don't know what the word is, like they have strawberry and, and, and you know, different kinds of chocolate of this brand. And we recorded everything. And we made a big story out of it that this is the first authentic brand in terms of audio branding. Because it was actually that sound. And I gained about 10 kilos in the studio. Brand theme. These are just audio branding, ways which to communicate. Again, audio logo just being one of them. Advertising sound, soundscapes, in branded environment, branded audio as we went to in Canaan, user interface, and user ID sounds as on the swipe of an iPhone. That's a user identification sound. If you walk away from here with nothing but this, there are five parameters. And think about when you work with those. Is your audio congruent with your emotional and rational brand attributes? How distinctive is it? Does it, does it, is it another, oh, okay, let's go and see what's in the charts. Let's see what's hip out there right now. And let's take that. That's not distinctive. It's not truly finding the voice. The recognizability is very important. That is, how fast can I recognize it? Um, four notes is too little for our brain to recap. Six, seven, eight notes is too much. That's why telecom is five notes. Ba 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 ba. Coca Cola is five notes. Ba 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 ba. Intel is five notes. Bum ba 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 ba. It's always five notes. No accident. It's how we're wired. We're hardwired like that. Flexibility. Think about McDonald's. One of the biggest, strongest audio brands in the world. They have problems right now, but incredibly strong audio brand. And think about the flexibility of that logo. You probably heard it in hundreds of different versions. Again, five notes. Most successful audio logos in the world, always five notes. Our brain cannot identify sound design based logos. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm you know, pointing to the car industry. Our brain is not wired like that. We need notes. That's why we can identify hit songs right away. We listen to it in, in the car, 
And guess what? I can play to you 20 years later, and it's hardwired into your system. We're all born geniuses in terms of remembering audio. I could start a song now that you probably haven't heard in 20 years. And I'll sing you the first three notes, and the whole, you know, everybody can sing the rest. Why is that? Why do we have this amazing computer up here to remember audio? Alzheimer's research, it's the last thing they go. They can't recognize their husband or wife, but they will recognize the song in their teenage years they first made love to, and they haven't heard the song 50 years, and they can sing the entire song through. That's, it's medical research. That's how brain, how we are hardwired. Honorability, don't rent your identification. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Don't license something from a composer. You need to own your identification. Think about anything. Think about this, Silele Bis. Just imagine renting that identification. You own that. You need to own it. So don't go with audio and go to some composers, some music. You need to own it forever, limitless, throughout the universe. No open-ended contracts. Ah, oh, we'll just use it a few years and then we'll see. You know how many... You become subject to blackmail, literally, because... Think about... I work with so many brands and they used something where the buyout scenarios were not cleared into forever. It was not, well, what if we want to use this forever? It's a question. You need to entertain. That was not cleared. And the brand, you know, gets damaged. And the brand agency relationship gets spread damaged. Because the brand comes to you as an agency and says, why didn't you protect me? You should have known better. We just used this eight years in our communication. We cannot pull it out of our communication. That's suicide. And now the composer wants this much money. Yeah, you have a problem. And the composer says, you know what? Your buyout's just quadrupled. How's that? And all you can do as a brand is say, okay, I'll pay. And whatever he wants in two years, okay, I'll pay. Just think about that. Protect your client. I'll just run through this. This is just... We test. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Maybe just one. This is uh, a situation where the, the client had some music and uh, it was from a cinema commercial. A cinema commercial was 60 minutes long, and it was a great piece of music that actually we wrote. We could have sold him just that piece of music and be done. And we told him, look, oh, we think this is great for your cinema 60 second commercial which you can develop. I think it really sucks for your audio identification, for your genetic code. And he said, please test it. And it tested a little less than what we had in mind. We do free association testing, meaning, is there something in, you know, positive, this is actually dimensional. Uh, is there a word in there that somebody says, ah, it's really depressive. We need to look into that right away. Why was that in there? Why did somebody say dark? Where we had 20 attributes here that we wanted to get through. Management, think about the future. We implement, here are the different consumer audio touch points.
And for time reasons, I'll just run through these. Think about standards. Big brands have verbal and visual style guides. They can be accessed and it is clearly defined what font you use, what color. It's not some kind of red or some kind of whatever. It is exactly defined. That's, that's your identification. We do continued education in trying to make the employees aware of you need to use this in all social media worldwide. No social media piece can go out there with some piece of music be behind it. And some intern somewhere in Malaysia makes that decision. No. Whatever is out there needs to be cleared. And the best way is have an audio data bank to pick from. You don't run into clearing problems, you can use it in any media you want to. There's no fear, it's just, it's clear. Metrics, so again testing, and we need to have an evolution, you know. Where we are today is, yeah, that's our genetic code, but it's like fashion. We need to adapt, 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 adapt to new technologies. And with this I'm going to close. Ask yourself, can you define your brand's sonic positioning? There's a singular strategy influence every brand touch point that uses audio. Does your brand style guide include audio parameters? Do you measure your brand's audio return on investment? You really know you pay this much money, how much money is coming back? Is there any any data that's measurable? And clients love that. If you talk, if you say, yeah, I wanna I wanna talk to your CFO, I wanna show him. I don't wanna hide and say, yeah, it's really great, this is creative, you know. No, 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 no. Let's talk to the controller. Does a new brand have a recognizable, iconic audio imprint? Are you as disciplined with your brand's use of audio as with other assets? Name the key elements that define your brand's audio DNA. Most brands can't. Again, 90% are mute. They disappear. Thanks, and um, I'll be around. Uh, and um, thanks so much for having me here. Again, I'm Kanuta, and thanks so much. Thank you very much, Ray. Any questions? We have some questions. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I was very curious uh, about many things out of it, but uh, I want to know how do you find your employee? I mean, how do you train people to do this type of work? Very interesting. We just hired somebody about uh, a month. I wasn't pitching. No. no, no, no. We just hired somebody, uh, and and we're um, we're growing extremely fast. Because of you know, it's it's once brands get it, they say, oh, of course we'll do it. And we ended up hiring an investigative journalist as a master's in journalism. Um, and because her, you know, intellectual aptitude, I knew she will get the audio writing part very quickly. You can learn that; it's not that hard. But I wanted the brains first, and so so she has a master's in journalism. She's German, and you know we're an American company, really. So you can't just like speak some English. You need to really, you know. So those are those were major major things. But I cannot put an ad out there and say, um, and I want to 
account manager in, in all your bandings. Like, what, what do you want? Does that answer your question a little bit? A little bit. <laughs> no, I know it's a top question and top answer. And it's a new science, you know, it's, it's very, very small. Uh, hi. Hey. Very, very interesting uh, approach, let's say. So I'm an advertising person for 20 years. And uh, I must say that you have a big fight to give with a visual approach. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So as far as I understood, this is new. Yeah. So you find this um, uh, not be aware of uh, part of branding. Well, actually, if you go back 50, 60, 70 years, yeah. your brands, you know, the jingle. And, and, and there was a time in brand new, in advertising where everything had a jingle. With the jingle, if, if you like radio, but as we know, radio is going not so well. So anyway, my, my uh, question is, how do you approach the clients in order to take you serious on the on this side, on the audio branding? Fear management. Fear management? Yeah. <laughs> you make him aware of how much money he burns every day. And that starts to hurt. And once he listens to you and understands he's paying into a bank he can never withdraw money from, he's non-existent. He has probably, you know, 90% recall, verbal and visual, and sonic, zero. And it comes from undisciplined behavior in his audio identification, audio communication. And once he gets that, that he burns money every day, then he starts to ask questions and say, well, how much damage have we done so far? But this is usually a C-level communication. The CEO or owner. But this means you have to do a lot of research. Where do you get the, your data actually? Because they are not so open with the financial data. So, the clients. The data? I don't need the data. I don't need the data. I just to show you number one and two in a segment. I say Coke and Pepsi. Who's number one? Who's number one? Coke. Who can I sing? Who can I identify with my eyes closed? And who, uh, so you, who, you know, destroyed millions and millions of dollars in licensing money they spent? Pepsi did. Pepsi is a mute brand. I don't have to test that. Can anybody sing Pepsi? Anybody? Mute? Mute. Anybody can sing Coke? Everybody. Okay. So you do comparison. Oh yeah. I, we, we have we have studies, you know, that, that any my my you know the main thing is usually with the CMO. You know, I talk to the CMO and and, and uh, you know once it once it gets there it's it's tough also for agencies, I have to say, because it's a process that needs to be done right, and it's a strategy process. And agencies often get a client and scramble to get the first stuff done, and then half a year into, they're already on review, pitching again against seven other agencies. So they don't want to go through this and open up another, you know, can of worms that what, what's it going to buy them at the end of the day? You know, the process is we got over the finish line. The clients were extremely happy coming back to the agency and said, thank you, thank you so much. But the pressure comes from the brands. It doesn't come from the agencies. If I'd be an agency, to be honest with you, I'd probably walk away. Because I don't want the headache. I'm so busy with the next movie, with the next this and that. And it's stuff that goes into campaign-driven. This is brand-centric. This is 
not campaign centric. I don't talk to the TV producer at the agency. I talk to the main strategist. That, that's a huge difference and, and that's to completely different because, you know, again, you're creation driven. An agency always says, oh, you're ready? Oh, yeah, sure, or your logo, sure, let's call five music, you know, music companies and let's have uh, 50 logos in a week. Fine? Doesn't work. It's not for us, but it's, it's, a, it's a real hard sell. But it's also exciting. Once you get it right, yeah. Okay. Thank you again Thanks for your presentation. Vă mulțumesc foarte mult pentru răbdare. Vă invit la o pauză mică, scurtă. Vorbim despre consumatorul viitorului, cine este el și avem un studiu în premieră și doi analiști, doi oameni de publicitate care vin și ne spun ce vrea consumatorul de azi. Pauză.